Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here. So I first heard about camel milk probably several years ago and didn't give it more than a second thought. And then recently I was at an event and I happened to be seated, seated next to a gentleman who named Walid has brought camel milk into the US. <laughs> and we're talking about just what he's been up to, his business or whatnot, his plans. And there was an event going on, so there was a speaker presenting. And I felt bad because I, I got curious. He talked about just how there's been data about camel milk helping various health conditions. And I was curious, I was skeptical. And so as we're at the event, I was, I was that guy who was on his phone looking at research databases. I wasn't just goofing off, but I was looking at some of the published studies on camel milk. And it was really surprising. Um, I went and took a look and found that there's actually a lot of studies on cow milk and various things that it can affect health outcomes. So I want to talk to you guys a bit about those and also just mention what this stuff is and how it's different. And I'm going to do my first live taste of camel milk towards the end. <laughs> I have not had it before. This just arrived. So some couple of big differences. Well, these are different animals. You know, cows have hooves. Camels actually have toes, and they're not categorized as ruminants. And because of that, that makes their milk pretty chemically distinct from that of cow milk. Funny little thing, um, ca I, was I was prone to want to write camel's milk and cow's milk, but as in owned by or coming from. But it's more common vernacular just to say camel milk, as in milk of a. So. I followed suit, but yeah, camel milk. So a couple of big differences is that there's, there's alpha-1 casein or A1 casein, and that's probably the part of cow milk uh, that makes it hardest to digest for a large number of people, apart from lactose. So lactose intolerance can cause really obvious quick symptoms right away, but then the casein compounds tend to cause the more delayed onset symptoms. And lactose is in both cow milk and camel milk, so there is that. They are the same that way. But the alpha-1, the A1 casein, is not in camel milk. Now, they have also bred cows to not make alpha-1 protein. So if that's the sole issue, there are some cow milk options. They're not as readily found, but many big health food stores will have them. Another difference here is lact lactoglobulin. So that's another protein which may be hard to digest, which is absent in camel milk that is present in all, all cow milk, even the ones that are A1 casein free. Camel milk is a little bit different in terms of the fat content. You know, not a ton. So some things I read made that sound like it was a bigger difference than it was. And what happens there is that when you hear about the fat content of cow milk, it's really fat content by weight, which makes it sound really misleading. So camel milk is probably between about 2 to 3 percent fat by weight, whereas cow milk is typically 3.25, and that's the standard for whole cow milk. Now, 3.25 percent fat or 2 to 3 percent fat sounds really skinny, sounds really lean, but here's where that's deceiving both ways. So, percent fat is percent fat by weight, and almost all of the weight in milk of any type is from water, which is non caloric. So, when we think about percent fat in food, What's really meaningful is the percent fat by calorie. And since water has no calories, and it's pretty much all the way to milk, even 3.25% fat milk ends up being 49% fat by calorie. So dramatic distinction there. And even 2% fat milk is still getting nearly the majority of calories from fat. So little difference there, not a huge one. Now, a difference as far as the type of fat, the type of fat you'll find in camel milk does not separate. It doesn't require the whole homogenization process. And that could be one of the big drawbacks about cow milk is just homogenization can break down those fats in ways to where they can become oxidized and they create more free radical damage. So camel milk, the fats are smaller molecules innately and they're a little more stable and they're easier in terms of they're not going to curdle, not going to separate, and not need that homogenization process. So that's a big distinction. Also, we see that camel milk is a little lower in saturated fatty acids and higher in some of the unsaturated fatty acids. There's also a couple difference in terms of nutrient contents. 
And these are, these are all significant. So camel milk is higher than cow milk in terms of potassium, magnesium, iron, copper, manganese, zinc. So a little bit higher in protein also. And then fat per fat, a little bit lower in lactose. Now cow milk will be higher in vitamin A, vitamin B2, and then cholesterol as well. And I mentioned lactose. So a couple of big differences. The allergenicity is huge. And this has been pretty well studied uh, in vivo and in vitro, so meaning in living things and also in test tubes. They've taken the antibodies that people make against cow milk, and they've tested those pretty extensively against camel milk. And it's been shown that really those who have even the most dramatic IgE milk allergies, it would not be predicted that they would have similar reactions against camel milk. So it would be a safe thing for them. And there's actually been 430 studies done looking at the differences between how camel milk can act upon disease states. The biggest ones here we're going to see are going to be autism, uh, diabetes, cancer risk, various infections, colitis, and also alcohol-induced toxicity. Probably the best documented of all, which really excited me, was diabetes. So some papers have shown that camel milk has versions of insulin that can make the human body more insulin <laughs> Excuse me, probably one more. Nope, all by itself, okay. So it's got versions of insulin that can make the human body more able to regulate glucose. And one paper I saw showed that using camel milk had almost as much effect as taking medications would for helping blood sugar, and obviously with much better safety. Also dramatic data on autism, which, which surprised me, really had no expectation. And even even some from double-blind studies. So camel milk itself seemed to improve behavior. And, you know, one thought would be to, th to think about how it's been speculated that with, with autism that there's reactions against these glidomorphins or caseomorphins, these compounds in cow's milk that act like a sedative. And these are lacking in camel milk. So something that may be bad in cow's milk is not present in camel milk. So there's that. But there's data suggesting that it's not just avoiding a bad, there may be some therapeutic benefit to it. So really curious. Also a lot of data about lactoferrin, one of the proteins in camel milk, and that it may be a factor on lowering risk of cancer development. Now lactoferrin is present in cow milk as well. There's been theories that the versions of the quantities in camel milk may be a bit different, that it could be a more robust version of lactoferrin. So let's start getting on to practicality. So we know that this stuff is probably non-allergenic, you know, better tolerated than cow milk, and there may be some therapeutic effects of that. But if we're going to use it, how does the stuff actually taste? Okay, drum roll please. So this is from Desert Farms Camel Milk, and this is the actual milk. You can get the milk, the colostrum, you can get the powdered milk. And this came... So funny story, this came boxed in a FedEx box saying perishable. Well, it sat <laughs> outside in the Sonoran Desert for a good half a day. Then we brought it inside and let it sit for a day or two in our pantry before I started thinking, hey, I wonder if that actually means perishable <laughs> and that we should open it. So I opened it and it was in styrofoam packs. I'm thinking, oh no, but it was perfectly chilled. In fact, there were some little ice crystals around it. So the packaging held up really well, even despite, you know, user error. Here we go. You know, I've read various accounts on the taste differences of camel milk to cow milk. And most accounts have suggested subtle differences, if any. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would notice a difference. When I'm thinking really hard about it, huh, I could think there's maybe a little more salty, but honestly, if you sat down two glasses and you know didn't tell me or it was a blind test, I don't think I could tell the difference. I don't drink cow milk on a regular basis. I can't think of when last time I would have was, but I wouldn't taste any obvious difference between that and cow milk. So fine, no problems at all. Then the other thoughts are, uh, purchasing it raw or pasteurized. You can get both forms, and this, this one was the pasteurized because it did come already mixed up. 
And I would advise that. Now, there's views on both sides of this thing. So there's arguments about raw milk being more positive in terms of having more good bacteria, more active enzymes. Some of the things that are good, like the lacto lactoferrin, would survive pasteurization. And some of the negatives about milk in general have, have been tied to homogenization, which this does not undergo. So not an issue that way. But there's a little data about some, some Middle East respiratory syndromes coming from bacteria from camel milk. Now, it's been argued that those are camels that are in the Middle East, not like the ones in the U.S. Maybe. There are other infections that could be carried by camel milk. And honestly, it's an industry that has not been thoroughly vetted, and the FDA has restricted the idea of passing raw milk across state lines. So I'd say err on the cautious side. You know, a small, even an easily innocuously transmitted infection, some of those can be a big deal. So I would avoid raw, raw milk that's been shipped. If you're talking about raw milk from a local dairy that you know, certainly a thought process and a consideration you may want to look more into, but I wouldn't buy and have raw milk products shipped. And this is a newer industry. We don't know a lot about it. And generally, I'm more apt to say, hey, let's err on the safe side. So I'd argue about doing the pasteurized over the raw. If we were talking about homogenization being a big factor, then there could be a stronger pressure to think about raw. But because homogenization is not required anyway, no big deal. So what else is different? Well, there's a price factor. And probably about 4 to $6 per serving in a lot of forms. And if you're going to be doing a lot of this over periods of time, that could be a significant consideration. You, the dried forms end up being a little more cost effective. Now, cow milk, if you've used dry milk before, it's not gourmet. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, we had that sometimes growing up when we didn't live by farms because it was cheaper. You know? But it's not as good. And a lot of that comes down to how the fats react from cow milk. Now, with cow milk, the fats are stored in smaller triglycerides, probably less of a factor. So big picture, if you really missed cow milk or if you're looking at more ways to help to lower allergic responses, you know, I should mention too, some studies showed that this could decrease allergies. So not just avoid a negative allergen, but decrease allergic responses. So if you want one more way to think about helping the immune system, helping the blood sugar, and having a fun alternative, then camel milk could be the way to go. <laughs> Take great, great care. We'll talk again really soon. Bye-bye.